you grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans, please, Romans chapter 9. And as you're turning there, uh, I bring you greetings from Cornerstone Church, once again in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It is such a great privilege to be back here with you again at this church that I love. When uh, I got on the plane myself and I got to bring... uh, Pastor Matt here, associate pastor at Cornerstone Church. When we got on the plane Wednesday morning, it was snowing in Jackson Hole. <laughs> do, you, do you know what snow is here? <laughs> uh, and my dear daughter on Thursday night called me. She said, Dad, uh, soccer practice uh, got shortened, not canceled, shortened because we were practicing in a snowstorm. So but it's a blessing to be here, to get out of the cold weather and uh, to be with you all. It was a wonderful uh, time with the brothers and the men this weekend at the men's conference, and it is just a privilege to be here with you. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Philip, uh, the CBC elders, deacons, and all of you for uh, the gracious invite to, to having us back here again. If there's one thing that's become clear to me in the many times I've had the privilege of being with you, and opening the Word of God with you, there's one thing that's become clear, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is blessing and building this church. He stands, as it were, as we see in Revelation chapter 1, among the lampstands, and Christ is with this church in this day and this hour, and he is blessing this church. And I praise God for this church. I praise God for, for you all, for your pastor, for the elders, for the work that God is doing here. In these dark days, CBC stands as a great light in a much-needed city on a hill in this place and in this hour and in our nation to proclaim the truth and the glory and the mercy and the love of the blessed and the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want you to know, those of you here, even if you're brand new, that it's a, this is a blessing, a blessed place, and you need to be here and you need to be plugged in here in this wonderful place by the grace of God. Bow with me in a quick word of prayer as we open God's word. Father in heaven, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. And I pray that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word, that only that which is true to your word and helpful for the salvation and the sanctification of your people would be spoken. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, it is no secret that our nation is in a severe spiritual and moral decay. Uh, The foul stench of moral rot has been rising and rising from among the United States like never before. Uh, My dear late grandfather, uh, who served in World War II, he would no longer be able to recognize the nation that he served. Uh, Our current administration has ushered in a a new level of filth, and many in our nation would have, are, I I should say, are heartily following. And it is absolutely tragic. It is maddening. However, however, as the people of God, it will not do for us to simply be mad. It might be tempting, as as I know it has been for me, to look on and upon the landscape of this nation and look at the sins of the times in disgust and to go about our day. However, the grace and the kindness of God in sending the Lord Jesus Christ demands that we pump the brakes a little bit and pause. And we ask ourselves questions like, what kind of love has God shown to us? Where would I be without the grace of God? What's my record in keeping the commands of God and thought, word, Motivation indeed. deed. 
we must have a heart for the lost. That frustration, and, and, and let me just say, we, we should have a, a righteous and a godly sorrow. Psalm 97.10, hate evil, you who love the Lord. However, our hearts must long for the salvation of even the most vile sinners. Uh, we must look upon uh, those who engage in the sin and lead in the sin of drag time, story hour, or whatever it is, and long for their salvation and care that they would come to know Christ and understand that apart from the grace of God, we are no better. We must remember that such were some of us. Maybe not outwardly in the same way, but certainly inwardly. We who have received mercy, how can we not long for the same mercy for others? We who have been saved, not by any works, a righteousness of our own, as we sing, but by the shed blood of Christ, we must deeply care that others would be saved, saved by that blood. How can we who receive the mercy of the undeserved gift of eternal life look upon ourselves as if we deserved it and others do not? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There is none who does good, not even one. Ephesians 2.1, you were dead in your trespasses and Sins. The believer in Christ is someone who, prior to the grace of God, was full of sin, dead in sin, naturally offensive to God, and yet rescued by the mercy and the kindness of God. And so we must, beloved, we must long and ache that others would receive that same mercy. We who have received the peace of Christ, how can we also not long that others would be rescued from the emptiness and the hollowness and the darkness of life apart from Christ? We need to have a broken heart for the lost in our day. And any temptation, that self-righteous disgust, looking down upon our nose like a Pharisee, that needs to quickly turn to a broken heart for the lost and the, and the salvation of all sinners. Paul said when he was in chains, he said, would to God that not only you but everyone who hears me would become like I am saved except in these chains. How is your heart for the lost? Do you long that sinners would be saved? Do you ache that others would receive the grace of God? Beloved, God has placed lost people around you. He has placed you around lost people. That is no accident. Do you have a heart for them? Listen to God's heart from Ezekiel 18. He's saying to Israel who were saturated in sin, he says, cast away from you all your transgressions which you've committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. No pleasure. Our text this morning will help us cultivate a heart for the lost. Follow along as I read in Romans chapter 9, if you haven't turned there already. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. God's inspired, inerrant, and sufficient word reads. I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. 
For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. This is the reading of the Word of God. The letter to the Romans was originally written in the first century to Christians in the city of Rome to proclaim the greatest message anyone has ever or will ever hear, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. That though the entire human race, whether you warmed a pew, did not warm a pew, anything in between, growing up, whatever it might be, the entire human race is naturally at enmity with God and in rebellion against God by will and by nature. And so the greatest problem in the universe before us, how can sinful man be reconciled to a holy God? How is this conundrum solved? A problem we cannot solve by our hands and by our deeds and by our efforts because they are as filthy rags before God. God's standard is perfect holiness. And we've all fallen short. And yet God moved by his own glory and moved by compassion for sinners. How can it be? He came down. He didn't leave us to the hell we deserved. He came from heaven, and he became a man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he lived, the only one ever to do so, lived in keeping the commandments, keeping them perfectly, fulfilling the law in his own person, by his own strength. And then he went to the cross, and he offered up his life, truly God, truly man, who deserved worship and praise and adoration forever and ever, he was nailed to the cross and treated as the most vile criminal. And there, God the Father laid the sins and laid the judgment and laid the condemnation of all of us who would simply put faith in Jesus Christ. And Christ died as our wrath-bearing propitiatory sacrifice. And on the third day, he rose from the dead to show that he is God and Savior and the way, the truth, and the life. That all who comes to him will be spared of the wrath that we deserve. He came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And so the gates of heaven are booted open for all who would believe and repent of their sins. And this is the message of Romans. Faith alone in Christ alone. Now in Romans 9, the Apostle Paul will turn a corner and discuss an apparent problem. It was a, a grave problem in the first century. As he's writing a couple decades after Christ rose from the grave and ascended back to heaven, there is a problem. Why do so many Israelites, and then, and that's a problem now, why have so many of them rejected Christ? And they were the, the chosen nation through whom the Messiah would come, to whom the word of God was originally given. And, and, and through whom the prophets came to be a light to the world. And their Messiah comes to them first. And they reject him and they call him things like Satan. And accuse him of a, being a blasphemer. They nail him to a cross. And so in these following decades... As the grace of God was spreading and Christ was building his church, there were very, very few ethnic Israelites who were putting faith in the Messiah. And so people were scratching their head wondering, what's going on here? Has God failed? And Romans 9 through 11 will gloriously answer that question. I'm not going to look at all that today. We're just going to look at the very beginning. As this section, which wrestles with What's going on with Israel? This section so appropriately begins 
with a broken heart for the lost. So I want us to ask two questions, just still by way of introduction here, just to kind of get us up to speed. What does it mean, number one, that someone is lost? And number two, why should we care about that? Just as a preface, as we walk up the porch here, what does it mean that someone is lost? Put simply, it means a person is unreconciled to God. They are unregenerate. They are unsaved. And so at least in that state, they are not going to heaven. They're enemies of God. God sees people ultimately in one of two categories. Absolutely. The lost and the saved. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. 1 John 5.12, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Those are the two categories then. Those who are reconciled to God and those who remain enemies. Those who are forgiven of their sin, those who are unforgiven. Those who have turn from their sin to trust in Christ and those who are still refusing and clinging to their sin. Second, why should we care? Why should we care whether or not someone is lost? One word. Love. Right. Love. Galatians 5.14 says, The entire law, all the commands of God can be summed up in one word, love. And the fullest expression of love, beloved, is to care about someone's eternal spiritual existence, their future, their eternity. Human beings are not just animals who live and eat and that's it. Everybody will be resurrected to spend eternity in one of two places. The Bible is absolutely clear about that, and anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. There's nothing better than to know Christ. There is nothing better than being saved, beloved. Living in the peace that knowing all my sins are forgiven. I have nothing to fear. As we sing, this truth is just incredible. As, as God looks at me as a believer, he, he sees the righteousness of Christ. All my sin was judged in the cross. There is now no condemnation. To know that God is control, in control and, and, and to, to, to have the mind of Christ and to know our eternity is guaranteed. It's just death is a doorway to unimaginable joy. There's nothing better than that and there's nothing more terrible. Nothing more terrible than an eternity without Christ. An eternal conscious torment, which the Bible clearly teaches. God is clear, and it would be unloving if his people were unclear. Those who refuse the love and the forgiveness offered in Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. We can't save anyone. Salvation is of the Lord. But we must pray, and we must care, and we must speak, and we must ache. Amen. Amen. Love drives the believer to care about the lost. 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ controls us. Notice Paul didn't say there, for the vile things we see on cable news controls us. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that we who live might no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on their and our behalf. Therefore, he says, we now recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. We are ambassadors for Christ, verse 20, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This is the heart we must have. And by the way, a broken heart for those who do not yet have spiritual life is a sign that you have spiritual life. We ought to wonder about those who profess the high and the exalted name of Christ and yet would go on and have zero care for the lost around them that they too would know Christ. Christ. 
perhaps they don't even know Christ at all. If you, like I have and do, need to grow in having a heart for the lost, I think this message, this passage, this passage will be of help. Romans 9, verses 1 through 5. As we travel through the text, we'll see a couple of points, a couple of hooks to hang our thoughts on. We're going to see the sincerity for the lost, and I'll repeat these. The sincerity for the lost, the sorrow for the lost, and the separation for the lost. Number one, the sincerity for the lost. Do you have a heart for the lost? Number one, the sincerity for the lost. Notice Paul's sincerity for the lost. Look at verse one. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies of me in the Holy Spirit. This text begins on a very sobering note of the highest solemnity and sincerity. And he makes three statements to emphasize his heart for the lost. I'm telling the truth in Christ. It's as if Christ is standing there with his omniscient eyes and he can say, I'm telling the truth and Christ knows it. I'm not lying. And it's critical that Paul says this because what he's about to say after this is hard to believe. Some might accuse him of lying or exaggerating for effect. He is not. His heart is so large for those who are not going to heaven. And he continues in verse 1, My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. In other words, I am not violating my conscience. What am I, I am about to tell you regarding my sorrow for the lost? Even the Holy Spirit within me. He could say the same thing who sees my heart and could tell you this is what I am feeling. The sincerity for the lost. Number two. The sorrow for the lost. The sorrow for the lost. Look what he says in verse two. I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. One of the greatest most loving, godly believers of all times lays his heart on the table for us. May our, may our God make our hearts like this. I have great sorrow. The word translated sorrow, it means a state of mental pain. Sadness, distress, it means to be overcome with grief. And this word sorrow in the original language is moved all the way to the front of the sentence to emphasize the degree of sorrow. And the word great is affixed to it. The Greek word mega, from which, from which we get our English word. The Apostle Paul, he says he has a mega, a great grief and distress as he looks around at his fellow countrymen who do not have the peace and the forgiveness of Christ. The prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament had this grief. I'm just going to read briefly. Jeremiah 9, he says this, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfarer's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go from them, for all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like a bow, lies and not truth prevail on the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. Paul continues in verse 2. I have unceasing grief in my heart. You have all experienced grief. Great grief, some of you. Paul says, I have unceasing grief. The original word unceasing has the idea of something that, that never stops. It keeps continuing without interruption. And grief is 
The word means anguish, emotional pain, distress. The Apostle Paul who said, follow me as I follow Christ. He had an uninterrupted emotional pain and anguish in his heart for those who had yet to surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that your heart for the lost? Or do you live your life thinking, well, (laughs) at least I'm going to heaven. The idea that a Christian should just be giddy all the time and shouldn't really be sad is foreign to the Bible. Absolutely foreign. The Apostle Paul said, I'm sorrowful, yet rejoicing. Sorrowful at the state of the land, rejoicing at God's grace to me. One of the godliest Christians ever, the Apostle Paul, the deepest, one of the, with some of the deepest love for Christ ever, said, I have continual, unceasing sorrow in my heart for those who do not follow Christ. But he doesn't stop there. Number three. Number three. The separation for the lost. The separation for the lost. Notice what Paul says in verse 3 about the separation for the lost. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Were it not for what Paul said in verse 1, and were it not for Paul's integrity and sincerity, what he says here would be hard to believe. For I could wish that I myself were accursed. That word in the original for accursed, anathema. It doesn't mean to have a bad day. It means to be eternally separated from God. To go to hell forever. And he emphasizes it again. Separated from Christ, verse 3. For the sake of my brethren. And he's not talking about believers. How do we know that? He clarifies it. Kinsmen according to the flesh. People who share the same blood and ethnicity as me. Israelites. Now. This is not teaching that we. Someone besides Christ. Could somehow die for the sins of others or be punished for the sins of others and save them and go to heaven. No. Heaven is by faith alone through Christ alone. Acts 4.12 There is no other name under heaven except Christ by which we must be saved. Paul is saying in effect, I have such a heart for these lost people that if it were possible I would go to hell forever. I would take their spot in hell So that they could have my spot in heaven. What kind of a love is that for the lost? I have to confess to you, beloved, I'm not there yet. I don't know if I could say that. Think about it. Think of a lost friend of yours. Maybe here in Stewart. If it were possible... Would you spend an eternity in hell for them so that they could go to heaven? Parents, if it were possible, would you go to hell forever so that one of your children could go to heaven? A heart for the lost. There's something very important we should observe about what Paul is saying. Two very important things. At the end of Romans 8, Paul is just hammering and rejoicing in the greatness of God's love in sovereign grace. He celebrates and says, those whom God foreknew 
he predestined. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What is Paul saying? He's saying salvation is accomplished by the sovereignty of God, not us, which is to say salvation is all of grace and all to the glory of God. And he goes on about that later in Romans 9. But there are some who say, well, why should I break for the lost if God is sovereign over salvation? I mean, God's going to save who he's going to save. That is a form of hyper-Calvinism that is sinful and that is wrong and that goes way beyond Scripture. We are never to think, well, God is in control and he's sovereign over salvation, so it doesn't really matter if, if we care about who gets saved. You'll not find a single verse in Scripture or a single person in Scripture rightly saying that or suggesting anything like that. Like Christ, like Paul, like so many missionaries, John G. Patton, William Carey, Henry Martin, Samuel Zwemer, David Brainerd, they embraced the sovereignty of God on one hand and ached for the salvation of the lost among them. We're to break for the lost because it's right and loving, as Christ did. Luke 13, 34, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, as he was weeping, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often, listen to him, how often I have wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. The Savior weeping over the city for the lost. So God's sovereignty and salvation is in no way at odds with having a heart that breaks for the lost. We mustn't think we're more spiritual than God. Paul ached, Christ ached, we must. Now notice something else too here. Let's ask the question. Who are those? Who are these people, these lost people for whom, cry, for whom Paul ached? Who is, who is Paul talking about? Is he talking about a say his uncle who was very loving and treated him well his whole life and blessed him and just wasn't saved and so he had this compassion for him? Not at all. Not at all. His fellow Israelites, his kinsmen, what were they like? How, how, did, the, how did these Israelites for whom Paul ached, how did they treat Paul? Turn to Acts chapter 9 with me. Keep your pen in, Acts 9, in uh, Romans 9 and turn to Acts chapter 9. Let's, just, let's ask a question and look. W what were these people like? Acts chapter 9, verse 23. Acts 9, verse 23. Just one book before Romans here. Acts 9, 23. The scripture says this. When many days had elapsed... The Jews plotted together to do away with him. Paul, that is. Previously known as Saul. But their plot became known to Saul. This is the Apostle Paul. They were also watching the gates day and night so they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. Paul had to, had to live like some animal on the run at the hands of his fellow kinsmen. Turn forward a few chapters. Acts 14. Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Acts 14, verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. N vain, neck vein bulging, angry, red-faced fellow Jews throwing cantaloupe-sized rocks to smash him to death. Verse 20, but while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. <clears throat> 
The next day, he, he went back into the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Acts 23, turn forward still to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23, verse 12. Acts 23, verse 12. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 who formed this plot. We're going to, they said, we're going to deprive ourselves of life's basic necessities until we murder that guy. Turn over to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Acts Romans for 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 24. Second Corinthians 11, verse 24. This is Paul writing again. Second Corinthians 11, 24. He says, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Where they strung him up and tied him up in one, two, again, throwing their shoulder and their arm as hard as they can to whip him on the back 39 times on five different occasions. Go look at verse 26. Verse 26, I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen. If there was a people, a group of people who hated you who slandered you, who tried to kill you wherever you went, who tracked you down, followed you from town to town. It'd be tempting to get jaded and say, you know what? They can just go to hell. I don't want them in heaven. I don't want them to have the, the blessing and the forgiveness and the eternal life of, of Christ. No way. The Apostle Paul, however, said, I have uninterrupted anguish for them. I would go to hell for them so that they could go to heaven. Beloved, God created the universe to display his glory and to be the stage upon which his plan of salvation through Jesus Christ would unfold and to rescue a people for himself from every tribe, tongue, and nation to receive the infinite life, the infinitely valuable gift of eternal life by faith in Christ. And he wants to use you for that plan, for the most vile people. The two greatest commands, love the Lord your God with all your heart, Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you want you to go to heaven? And you need to want them, even the them, to go to heaven. Yeah. Part of loving your neighbor as yourself is having something of Paul's deep heart anguish over those who have yet to surrender their life to Christ. So, what is your heart? Where is your heart for the lost? Where is your heart for even the crooked people in high places of leadership in our nation? And the vile people who applaud them and are, are jaded in their sins. When you turn on the TV and hear about the, the filth of this nation, do you self-righteously think, huh, can't believe they would do that. 
they just need to be gone. Or like Paul, does your heart break for them and ache for them? In verses 4 to 5, Paul goes on to discuss and lament the lostness of Israel in a very interesting way. In light of the privileges that Israel has. And so what makes their lost state all the more sorrowful is the spiritual privilege they had and yet wasted. Right. And in, verse, in verses 4 and 5 of Romans 9, he lists about eight privileges and eight blessings from God to Israel that makes their hard-heartedness all the more sorrowful. He says in verse 4, Who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises. Whose are the fathers, from whom is the Christ? According to the flesh, who is God over all, blessed forever and ever. Amen. The first century Israelites were blessed with all these privileges, and they nailed Christ to the cross. However, as privileges as Israel was, this is a word for us in our day. It's a word for us. What privileges, spiritually speaking, do we have here in 2024? Think of the blessings. Think how much access we have to, to, to Bibles and to good churches where the Bible is faithfully preached like this one. And you can come and hear the truth and get discipleship like this church. And you can go online and listen to messages and preaching and you can order books and they can be at your house in, in like a, a couple days. We are without excuse. Amen. What about some of us here this morning though? Are you someone who has yet come all the way to Jesus Christ? Are you someone who privilege after privilege has been laid before you and you've heard the message of Christ and you have a Bible maybe on your shelf or you have a relative or a friend who has loved you enough to tell you that if you do not turn to Christ you will be lost for eternity or maybe you've heard something on the radio or you have Christian books what about you? Christ died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the grave to prove he is God and Savior. Why would you hesitate any longer to give your life to Christ with all these privileges you have? Being life, having life, having another day, having another breath. That you can go out from this building, and you might not actually, but perhaps you'll go out from this building and be able to look at the sun and the blue sky and the, blue, the beauty of Florida. Why would you hesitate to come all the way to Christ? Why would you delay to run to Christ? It's like a guy sitting, sitting on his couch and he has a $500 million winning lottery ticket in his hand and he says, I don't know. It, it's, it's a long drive two miles down to where I have to turn this in. That guy's without excuse. Infinitely worse. Infinitely because money cannot buy salvation. is to hear about Christ and to say, I don't know. I don't know. You're without excuse. Come to Christ. Run all the way to Jesus. He receives sinners. Don't think or say to yourself, oh, I don't know. I've, I've sinned too much. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what kind of background I, has, I have. God knows it all. He only came for people like you. For vile sinners for outwardly immoral sinners, for inwardly immoral sinners, all sinners. Amen. He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. But if you refuse, there will be no excuse. Absolutely none. You will stand before God one day. And God, you will be reminded with a fully informed conscience of time after time after time after time and resource and opportunity and all the privileges that you had. And your condemnation will be just. For those of us who have turned to Christ, 
if you need to grow like I do in this, some, a couple suggestions for cultivating, practically speaking, a couple suggestions for cultivating a heart for the lost. Number one, understand the gravity of your own sin. Amen. Understand the gravity of your own sin. If, like me, you have not arrived in sanctification, you have a ways to go, you're not Jesus, you're not dead in heaven and glorified, you still have remaining sin, and you have a past also. After being a believer for decades, the Apostle Paul said of himself in 1 Timothy 1.15, I'm a chief of sinners. And his awareness and his humility to remember his sin drove him and gave him a, a tender and a large heart for the lost. Second, understand what you deserve. Don't only understand the magnitude of your sin. Understand what you deserve. The wages of sin, beloved, is death. And that's not only talking about physical death. You can read Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15, and see what the end and the just end. Far be it from us that we would accuse Christ of being unjust. The just end to which Christ will sentence the unrepentant. Remember what you deserve, and that will move you to a compassion for the lost. Third, remember the privilege of salvation. Think about how privileged you are. Huh. How good is it to know that we are forgiven? Talk about a sigh of relief. Talk about an unworthy phrase to use for what we've received to know Christ. Fourth, meditate on the love of Christ. Meditate on his love often. Do things like take Matthew chapter 27 where you have a long, detailed, inerrant account of Christ suffering for our sins and just, and just wear a path around the cross. And see him who said, while they were mocking, ha, if you're really the son of God, come down from the cross, then we'll give you the time of day and believe in you. And look at him who stayed there. Fifth, understand the darkness of the lost. Understand, number five, the darkness of the lost. Understand the darkness of the lost. Yesterday evening, we went down to dinner. To, to look at the water. We don't have oceans in Wyoming, oddly enough. And um, so as I love to do when I'm here, go to downtown Stewart and uh, enjoy some, some fish. Um, and many people were out. But I looked around and I was reminded how empty life is without Christ. Yes. How dark. What a waste life is without Jesus Christ. And that there might be happy faces painted up on, on everybody. But the unregenerate live empty lives, flailing in the darkness, nothing to grab onto. They're without Christ. They have no hope. What a dark condition. Understanding that cultivates a, a heart for the lost. And sixth, pray. Pray for the lost. One of the great ways to grow in love for the lost is to pray for the lost. <coughs> Pray for our president. Pray for others in his administration. Pray for those who you know who are hard-hearted, who we might think they could never come to Christ. That's some suggestions on cultivating a heart for the lost. But what do we do for the lost? In addition to praying, what should we do for the lost? Obviously, we pray. We share Christ with the lost. We must. We, the, the brothers put it up here earlier, Matthew 18. Matthew 28, excuse me, verse 18. Go, therefore, and make disciples. The Christian has been given a mission of speaking, speaking the good news that God has not left us to our sin, but has sent Christ to be crucified and risen in light of our sin. We must speak that.
The world might not interpret it as love, but God, who is the only one that matters, who we live before, he understands it is loving, and it glorifies him even more. That's the highest reason to do it. If you had a cure for cancer and didn't share it with anyone, you would not be a loving person. The message of Christ crucified is the only way to be saved from hell and wrath and condemnation. It is the only way. If embraced savingly, and if embraced by childlike faith, instantly, permanently, irreversibly, the most disgusting, vile sinner is clothed in the righteousness of Christ and seen by God as a, chi a child of God, forever welcome to do his family. Also some things we can do for the lost. Unite with a strong local church like this one. Unite with, plug in, become a part of what God is doing. And the thing God is doing is in and through the church. Uh, th this church is an outpost from heaven to declare the love of Christ to the lost. The year was, the year was 1955. Perhaps you know the story. Five believers from the United States... Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCauley, Peter Fleming, and Roger Udarian moved to the jungles of Ecuador to evangelize a tribal people called the Warani. And the Warani were not known to be a nice, welcoming people. They didn't have the gift of hospitality to outsiders no contact with the outside world, and these five believing men who had a heart for the lost worked hard to establish a relationship with them slowly and carefully. They would get in their airplane and fly circles to, to lower gifts and offerings to them to, to show, hey, we care for you and give them presents and establish a, a friendship. After several months of this, January 3rd, 1956, the missionaries established a camp closer to the tribe that they called Palm Bay. It was on this long sandbar in the Karere River. And then five days later, on January 8th, 1956, a group of Warani warriors came to them, and all five of the men, Nate Singh, Jim Elliott, Ed McCauley, Peter Fleming, Roger Udarian, they were speared to death by the men. And, and their bodies were thrown into the river. Before his death, Jim Elliot famously said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Amen. The men gave their lives because they broke for the lost. But it didn't end there. News spread of their martyrdom. Even Life magazine at the time published a big story about it. And after the martyring, two of the wives, Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint, did the absolute unthinkable. Those dear sisters could have thought, you know what? You do that to my husbands, you can go to hell. They packed up their lives and went in, went to live in the Warani tribe, the very tribe whose hands had held the spear and murdered those men. And they lived among them and said, we want to take up residence with you and be your neighbors and do life alongside you. And they were not killed. And they stayed there and learned the language and learned the customs and they shared Jesus Christ with them. And they spoke the good news that though you are sinners like us, God has sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave. And by faith in him alone, if you would bow the knee in faith and repentance, he will wipe away your murderous sins and cleanse your bloody hands and every other sin that you've committed. And many, 
many Warani were converted to Jesus Christ. And they gave their lives to Christ as a result. Even some who had held the spears that day gave their lives to Christ. In fact, Warani believers, even in modern times, still use the Karere River to baptize people in. What kind of a, lo uh, what kind of a love for the lost? Did dear Mrs. Elliot and Mrs. St. have for those Warani murderers? Is this your heart for the lost? As you look around in Stewart and beyond, the news, friends, family, coworkers, people you work with, God has placed you. Every Christian is a missionary. Right. Some go, some stay. All of us are called to be a light. Everyone we interact with daily will spend eternity in one of two places. What is your heart for the lost? Father in heaven, thank you that you have sent a Savior without whom we would all be justly condemned and that eternally because the wages of sin is death. We understand, Father, that the ground is flat at the cross. All have sinned. There is none righteous, though not even one. And Father, we thank you that you have moved by love, but God, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. And Father, I pray that if anyone here this morning, anyone hearing this has yet to run all the way to Christ, that they would understand their privilege and their plight should they delay. But they would understand and see a loving, compassionate, gentle and a welcoming Savior who will instantly forgive them. And for the rest of us, may we ache for the lost. And I, pr I pray for your richest blessing upon this church and upon CBC and everyone here that you would use them mightily to bring in sinners to the Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.